All right, everyone. I'm excited to have on one of the happiest, most positive energy practitioner, coach, leader in our industry, Dr. Mindy Pell's on the show today to talk nothing about fasting. <laughs> I don't know that if that's was possible. actually the best introduction <laughs> I've ever had. I will take that. Normally uh, people want to say like your, you know, your accolades, but I will take <laughs> for sure. Thank you for that. I just like to have conversations with people nowadays and just feel like they're sitting down having a cup of tea with us or coffee. Agreed. So I just think it's so fun to talk to you and you just, I've listened to all your podcasts and your videos and you're obviously inspiring millions around the world. Cause you've just, since you started years ago, just huge impact. And you have this new book that's finally coming out in December. I had to have you on the show to talk about, because I just love everything you say, but just the KetoCon conference was just like, aha, oh my God, that's just cool. what we need out there because as we will talk today, my audience is obviously more endurance athletes and my background athlete and chronic stress and a female athlete and 51 year old perimenopausal. Oh my I think there's a lot of people listening out there. They're like fasting. I'm doing all this fasting. Am I doing it right? How to do it? I'm a female. Mm. I've got a hormones and I'm mm. not losing weight and I feel like crap. And so today I just wanted to dial in all this that we can in our time together and get everyone needs to order this book. Cause it's not, I didn't get a sneak peek at it. I ordered it, but we can see the beautiful cover in the background over there. Oh, with your thank you. Yeah. We should have sent you an electronic <laughs> copy. Okay. I'm sorry. We'll make sure you get a book. <laughs> no, it's okay. I got one on the order for oh, Christmas, you. my Christmas gift. So thank talk you, about what this book is about, why you needed to write another book and what was missing in our world. It's such a great question or why we needed another fasting book. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting is that I've been teaching fasting um, to, you know, on my YouTube for about seven years now. It's been a long time. And um, I was seeing so much help over there, like not just with people varying their fast, but specifically with women. And I really came up with a clear formula that women can follow um, that will allow them to succeed at fasting. So uh, to, to answer your question, actually, when, uh, I don't know if you remember Dave Asprey and Will Cole came, Dave came out with his book. It was like two years ago, came out with fast that this way. And mm -hmm. then Will came out with intuitive fasting. And in both those books, what I thought was, oh my God, finally, somebody's going to talk about women. Like Dave gave a whole chapter on it, but no, in both of those books, neither of them talked about how women should fast. They just said women should fast differently. So that was sort of the catalyst. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm going to write this book because what I'm seeing with millions of women giving me feedback is working. And so that, that was where it was born is I kept waiting for a book to come out, you know, writing a book is a big project, um, but there was none. So I wrote, well, I wrote one. Well, and your book, we'll get to what it's about, but the for females, as Dr. Stacey Sims and people talk about, there's not a lot of research for, on females. No, no. And so even for the athletic world, I would say like, okay, that faster study everyone refers to was done on all men. Yes. So how to take this information from research? How do you find research on women to figure out what is best for them? Is there yeah. more out there? Well, it's interesting because that was a dilemma when I wrote the book. So I have six different fasts and I gave bullet points as to why you would do each fast. So you can understand, okay, this is the tool I want to pull out. And then I give the science behind it. And in my book, there, the science is everything from mice to men to women to combination. So I put it all in there. And I say, and this is really strongly how I feel, is that science in general gets us in the ballpark. But as women, we've got to learn how to apply it to ourselves. And you'll even see in Fast Like a Girl, there's so much freedom and variation of when to fast and when not to fast. I find that women within 30, 60 days of learning to fast like a girl, they just, they start to find their rhythm. So there's a lot of intuitive, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of um, uh, N of one, you know, yeah. for women, but I give the formula so that women know what to follow now figuring out your length fast becomes a personal journey. Yeah. Cause I think it's, it's so fascinating, you know, fasting and then the eating part, you know, what to yeah. eat and when, and the why, and, you know, nutrient dense, rich foods that balances your blood sugar. So, you know, that's the fasting is one thing, sorry, helicopter. 
but the other thing is eating because a lot of people I find, okay, it's a totally different subject, but I'll just say it now. It leads to eating type of disorders because people, their addictive personalities find that they get too extreme fast. It's what I always yep. talk about the Goldilocks effect of everything. Like fasting is beneficial, but how much of it's too much. And then we lose that fear of a relationship, healthy relationship with food to know what to eat and how to eat. Cause so many people get these extended fasts that they just like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to eat or I don't know how to eat. Or I'm scared to eat food. Cause it'll make me fat. So Let's right. just, you know, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really important point. So in the book, I give two different eating styles. I give one that I call keto biotic, which is mm -hmm. a higher form of carbs, keto carbs. It'll keep you in ketosis, but it'll help you make sure that you fuel the microbiome of your gut. And then the other food uh, style that I give or I teach in there is called hormone feasting foods. And that's when you, at certain times of your cycle, you need to go in with a lot more carbs. And this is where, uh, you know, so much of the keto world has destroyed women is because we have amazing results with keto and then we do it all month long, but your hormones demand that you step out of keto every once in a while. And I think yeah. once you find that rhythm with food, um, it actually, be, you start to see, it, it's a little bit like you can have your cake and eat it too. You know, you can, you can go keto at certain times of the month and then you can back away and you can go hormone feasting. Meanwhile, every single food style you're picking or you're doing is got at the base of it, you know, chemical free, organic, healthy, non-GMO foods. I, I do believe that that it doesn't matter what time <laughs> of the month you're in, that needs to be yeah. a priority. For sure. But that's what I love what we're talking about, the different types of fasting, because I think it's what we just, I just said, is that that relationship with food and being fearful of people that, for example, like you said, keto, that they're scared to eat any carbs and all carbs are evil, but you're giving them permission. It's okay. It's your luteal right. phase. You can have that's some right. non-keto foods and still feel amazing. And even better if you were starving your body of any of those foods during luteal phase and really mapping out your whole cycle for that female to feel, perform and look her best in life. I think we have to really look at that. It's not just the same all the time. It's, and Ben Azadi started that with the metal, his keto flex, keto like, flex yeah. don't stay keto all the time. And it's give people permission. It's people get so stuck that this is the be all and all that. This is what I have to do. Like I'm always going to do 16, eight fast. I'm always going right. to just do 50 grams of carbs a day. And there's variation in everything we talk about. So do you want to talk a little bit about the the four, like if you are perimenopausal, premenopausal, is there a different way yeah, that there's, I mean, there's my three, 10 years yeah, before? Yeah, there's three different areas that I, that I see hormonally for women. There's um, the, you know, cycling woman or what we would call like childbearing years. There's perimenopause where those ovaries are starting to wind down. And then there's postmenopause where you, you haven't had a cycle for a month. And the same rules apply, you just time it a little differently. And the best way I can explain this is that with men, we really, men only have one hormone they need to think about, and that's testosterone. Uh, they're, the fecal cells you know, around the testes, what they'll do is that they'll end up producing uh, testosterone, go up into the brain, and they'll start to make estrogen. So you get that conversion in the brain to estrogen, where for women, um, what, you know, we make, our ovaries make uh, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and our adrenals uh, make part of that as well. Mm -hmm. So when we look at how women need to fast differently and how these different times of life, we have to take in estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And here's the bottom line. Estrogen loves when you fast. Estrogen does really well with keto. Estrogen just does really well with hardcore exercise, marathoning and crossfitting and Spartan racing. Like you will thrive as estrogen is building and estrogen peaks. Progesterone is completely the opposite. So they may appear to be the say under the category of sex hormones, but progesterone, if cortisol goes high, progesterone becomes shy. She will not come out and you will find that you're, you miss your cycles and that all of a sudden you're struggling with just your overall hormonal health. The other part of, of progesterone is we wanna keep glucose really high. So if glucose goes, goes high, then we can make progesterone, but it, once glucose goes low, we can't make progesterone. So it's like the characteristics of these sex hormones are so vastly different for women. So now with that understanding, with a cycling woman, 
the first part of her cycle is when estrogen is coming in and the back half of her cycle is when progesterone is coming in. So in the new book, I have something called the fasting cycle, which is a, a visual where you can look at what the different type fasts are that you want to do on different days of your cycle. We actually are creating an app now for, oh, okay. women, for women too. So you would just plug in and start to track your cycle. And then you'd start to see what day, you know, you can learn your, the, the algorithm will get to learn your cycle and tell you what fast to do and what food to do. So hmm. super excited about that. The perimenopausal woman, as you know, is like, sometimes it's every two weeks, sometimes it's every two months. Uh, it, you never know when your cycle's coming or going. Um, in that scenario, you really want to get to know the characteristics of, of these hormones. Progesterone mm -hmm. makes you feel more inner. Progesterone makes you more hungry. Progesterone, when it's low, you, you, you're not going to be able to sleep as well. Um, you might have more anxiety for the perimenopausal woman. You might spot. That's a pretty common uh, indication that you need to build progesterone. Estrogen, um, for the perimenopausal women, you'll feel that your, your skin starts to become dry and your hair becomes dry and your mucosal membranes become dry and cognitively you struggle. You can't remember, your brain kind of shuts down. That's the need for estrogen. And then testosterone is very focused for women. It's a very much not just libido, but it's motivation and drive. Mm -hmm. So for the perimenopausal woman, what I recommend is get to know these. I think also you could do like, I know this is crazy for the perimenopausal woman, but you could do an ovulation kit to mm -hmm. see where you're ovulating to kind of learn how to time your different fasts. And then, the, and then the postmenopausal women, you know, you can fast anytime, anywhere, but you still have to think about progesterone. So you need to step out of uh, fasting at least once or twice a week. In the new book, I have a 30 day reset that postmenopausal women can follow for 30 days that I think will be really helpful for them. So you're saying to look at match your hormone cycle with your fasting. So your fasting duration should be like the minimum. Is it just kind of assume that 12 hours overnight fast dinner to breakfast should be normal? Yeah. 12 then, to, yeah. 12 to 16 hours based off science is, is really what intermittent fasting is. It's eight hours after your last meal, your body's going to start to switch over into that fat burning ketogenic system. So, um, so yeah, so it's, but 12 hours, you can safely say you're over in fat burning. Okay. So if I'm say, you know, 30, 40 year old having normal cycle, 28 days or so, then when should I be fasting and why should I fast? Yeah. And, and what age are you? You have a yeah. normal cycle. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Cause I, I think I had so much stress in my forties that I never had normal cycle when I was 35, right? I was doing yeah. Ironmans every year. So yeah. So if say sometime in your life, you have a normal cycle. Yeah, let's say 35, let's <laughs> 35. say 35. So 35, 40, anything under 40 in general, because at 40 is about when the ovaries start to wind down. Mm -hmm. um, so typically the day one of your cycle through day 10, you can go into longer fasts. Like so longer fast, your definition of fasting. So six intermittent fasting, like 16, eight kind of thing, but yeah. longer fast means what? 18, anything over, anything, anything over 24 over... hours. Okay. So that, so in the book, I lay out six and it, it 24, the evidence is it'll reset your gut. 36 is what I call the fat burner reset, because we have evidence that it'll really unstick uh, weight loss. 40, 48 hours, there's research showing that it can reboot your dopamine system. So people who have mental health challenges um, are, you know, often find that they are, their moods improve. And then the, the Mac daddy is Walter Longo's 72 hour fast, the three day water fast. I think I'd have to go to deserted Island to do. <laughs> oh, it's so, you know what we're going to do? We're, we're actually going to do one as, as a worldwide one, uh, the first week of January with the Hay House community. And what's really cool is we're it's going to be a three-day water fast. I'm doing a webinar every day to keep people motivated. A 10-hour webinar? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just keep yeah. talking all day. No one go to the kitchen. No one's going to Good idea. To <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. I was, I was more thinking of giving everybody a rah-rah, being able to answer questions. So um, but yeah, I mean, it's three day water fast as daunting as they sound will, will change your relationship to food will change your, the relationship to your body. It's quite incredible. So what type of prep I always think about, you know, how we need to prepare to do a water fast. Like I was just doing a webinar 
podcast on becoming a fat adapted athlete switch to like a low carb to become fat, low carb athlete. So you have a kind of transition phase. Do you, you know, you just don't say, Hey, I'm just eating standard American diet. I haven't fasted at all. I'm going to jump into a three day water fast. Do you have kind of prep phases oh, yeah. for people? Yeah. In the book, I, I lay out a whole prep pl- program. Um, I'll give you some of the highlights of it, which is uh, for starters, making your food changes is first. So yeah. I assume if you're listening to this podcast, you've already got a low carb slant. Um, but I, I even think it's just making sure you're not eating processed carbs. You're exactly. Eating Real food. Carbs. Real yeah. food. I don't know how you feel about this, but there's like so many of these keto like foods out there and they just don't interest me. I'm interested in real food. It's just more of the same synthetic make. If you ever walk around Expo West, a big, huge natural product show in Anaheim is hundred thousand people. It's insane of all the stuff. It's just keto food is just, is I always say like what you've started got me saying is nature's food and just eat nutrient dense nature's foods not in a package, even if it says keto approved, I just think it's all junk. So it's all junk for sure. Real food. (laughs) Yeah. So, so as far as prep, you want to switch your food and probably the most important food to switch is your oils. So Mm. many people are eating the inflammatory oils that are giving them insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So make sure you get off the canola, the corn, the cotton seed, all those oils. I, I put lists of them in the book. Um, and then switch to nature's carbs. And then if you want to go low carb, that's great. Um, and then you start just pushing your breakfast back by an hour. And, and here's the, here's the crazy part. If you want to start training yourself. And again, I'm going to say that this audience knows about extreme, uh, ath- athletics. So it's just like anything you're training for. You mm-hmm. want to be in discomfort. You want yeah. to get to that point yeah. where it's a little bit uncomfortable because that's where the body adapts. So mm-hmm. if you push your breakfast back an hour and you're uncomfortable, great. So push it back an hour, eat an hour later, do that a couple of days in a row until you're not uncomfortable anymore. And then the next day, push it back in, or the next, after three or four days of that, push it back another hour. So you start to slowly compress this eating window, which is um, really the, the door in to these longer fasts. And that you'll, you'll say in the book, based on what phase you are in life as a female hormone cycling when is it appropriate and when is it not appropriate? Like, should we fast when we're ovulating and like, what's the duration? So, um, so in the book, I, uh, day one through day 10 in the follicular phase, I gave them new names. Hold on. Let me let my dog out. I'm sorry. (laughs) That sounds like a song. Let the dog out. (laughs) Woof. Woof. Go let the dog out. So, so anyways, the, um, in the, in the book, I call it the power phase. The power phases are where the hormones are the lowest and we can go into more keto and more fasting. So in those phases, you can do any of the six fasts. So you can do a three-day water fast really well. And the power phases are basically day one through day 10 of your cycle and day 16 through day 19, sometimes day 20 of your cycle. Um, so these are, if you go and look, type Google, a hormone chart, you'll look and you'll see that these are where the dips are in hormones. So when the hormones go low, you can go high with your fast and your ketos and your keto, keto lifestyle. Um, and then in ovulation, I called it manifestation phase in the new book, because I was like, you can manifest anything. Once I started to really understand like where hormones come into play, I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like you have estrogen testosterone and testosterone at its peak. And then you have a little blurb of progesterone. So because of progesterone being there, we want to make sure that we don't fast too long. So 15 hours is about the max that I recommend people go. I also have found during the ovulation window that if you go into autophagy, which usually starts about 17 hours, that a lot of people can start to detox. And, um, and that is also why I don't have you go into keto during the ovulation manifestation phase, because, um, if, if you're in keto, you're getting too, and you're fasting and you're stimulating autophagy, those two can really cause people who with high toxicity, Mm. uh, can cause problems. And then the last phase day 20 till you bleed. So if you have a 28 day cycle day 20 till you bleed, you want to step out of fasting and you want to go into the hormone feasting. Now, I want to point out a couple nuances at that phase. So if you're like an expert faster and you're like, oh my God, no fasting, 
you could probably do 12 or 13 hours during that time. Um, it you would be okay. You just the reason I have people step out of fasting during that week is because if cortisol goes up, then you, progesterone is going to go down. So, but if you've been fasting a while, it's not going to be stressful to your body. So cortisol is not going to going to spike. But then when you eat, definitely don't do keto. You need more glucose to make sure that progesterone shows up. And so a lot of women that want to lose weight, that's a modification that we make. I'm just laughing. Side note, I don't know if this would help during that phase though. I was listening to your Dr. William Davis, super gut probiotic, and I just made my first batch oh, and, nice. it, and it increases your oxytocin. So maybe you yes. have that every day during a luteal phase. I wonder if that helps oxytocin when it help the progesterone levels. <laughs> it's actually a, re- it's actually a really good idea. What we're starting to do, and we're going to do this with the app is time everything to the, to a menstrual cycle. So women will be, we would bring in things like that. Like, Hey, you might want to try this yogurt during the, these phases of, of your cycle. So eventually that will all be built out, but that's a wow. great idea. That yogurt's amazing. Did you like I it? I know. I just, I'm on day two and my aura ring sleep score, deep sleep, 10% up last night, first night. Wow. I'm like, it must be the old root rye. Yeah. Oh my God. Amazing. <laughs> Let me know. Will you, will you message me if it continues that way? Yeah. Cause we're, we're really, he has some incredible, I mean, he didn't just come up with a theory. He actually has tried it on thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people. So, um, you know, he has, ev- he has good evidence behind what he's saying with that yogurt. Yeah. So in fact, it'd be fascinating to put it into the fasting and the hormone cycle to really optimize hormones and just yeah. feel good. So then, so that's a, like the menopause or premenopausal female that has normal cycle. Then what if you fit in the exercise in there? How do we, like I was telling you since KetoCon, I've been working on everything you guys were saying, like, okay, what if we're exercising? How do we map in or exercise and adjust our training based on our fasting and our hormones and try to sync that all and map out that cycle? Yeah. So this is, these are my general ideas around this. And I, 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 once I started mapping everything to the cycle, I was like, oh my God, why do we have a weekly exercise program? I you changed know, that. I changed, I wrote a training peak schedule, 30 day cycle to 35 based Amazing. on, I'm putting everything in what you're saying and putting that Amazing. all in together. So Amazing. So here's, here's my general idea. Again, let's go back to the personalities of these hormones. Estrogen does fine with stress. Estrogen mm-hmm. does fine if we, if we push ourselves. So anything you want to do cardio wise, anything hit training, anytime you want to push anything, you want to do it in these power phases where the hormones are low. So day one through 10 and day 16 through 19, those are the times you want to go into extreme, like tough workouts. Now the manifestation phase during ovulation, you have testosterone at its peak. So here's what I can't figure out. Like what I can't be the first person to think this up. Like, okay, so you have testosterone we should use it to yeah. build muscle. So I, why, you know, we should in that five day ovulation window, what if one day we did arms, the next day we did back, the next day we did legs, then the next day we did, you know, glutes. And we really used that testosterone to our advantage. But the trick is, is that when estrogen is at its peak, the ligaments are going to be, mm. the ligaments themselves will be really, really tight And the tendons are really loose. So you're more prone to injury. So any Mm -hmm. kind of exercise or strength training exercise you do during this ovulation window needs to be slow. So you Uh, would not do plyometrics. You would not do HIIT training. All of that is done best in the power phases. Mm -hmm. But in the manifestation phase, that's when you would power up on all of your weightlifting, just slow Heavy. heavy weights. Yeah. Like doing yeah. the three to six wet reps of just heavy yeah. weight doing like three to five sets of it and just yeah. more lifting. Yeah. That makes sense. So that would be great. And then fasting, we match that out. And then when you're going towards early luteal phase to mid to, do you break it up like early, mid luteal yeah, phase, think, late luteal? I think once you come off ovulation, you're, you're pretty good going back into some more fasting, more hardcore exercise for a couple of days. This is where every woman's a little different. 
But when once you hit day 20, progesterone's coming on the scene. And what I would say in that, that's where your yoga is great. That's where your Pilates is great. That's where walking, hiking is going to be good. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, like, I was a competitive athlete in college. I, I played on a tennis scholarship at the University of Kansas. So I know what it's like to push yourself uh, extreme wise. And it's it's horrific to think about spending a week where you're just doing yoga and walking and mm -hmm. hiking. But what I found is once I started to do this, this time, everything to the, to the cycle, I actually performed better when I went into other parts of the cycle. So we need to look at that week before our cycle as um, a time for recovery. Yeah. Well, that's what I was mapping it out since I listened to you a bunch of times and going, okay, you and build, build, build in different phases. Like each week is a different workout program. Then that fourth week is your deload week, but also your restorative week. And that's right. Doing more, you know, like you're saying, nurturing exercises is yoga and Pilates and that's right. Beach walks. If you can <laughs> beach walks, beach walks are the best. My fave. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that the, again, I'm like, why, why haven't we done this before? Why is it taken until 2022 to figure this out? Yeah. And um, I, I just think we live in a patriarchal world that's very linear, very black and white. And I think one of the things that a lot of us are now doing is stepping out and saying, hey, women need to do these things different. All every, all the biohacks that have become so popular, the the cold plunges and the saunaing and the all the extreme sports have become so popular. We need to start to treat, teach women how to do that and bring more of the feminine back to healthcare. So true. I mean, I'm with you. Then it, you know, it's fascinating to track your, like I tried to map out what NutriSense is saying, what happens to your glucose mm -hmm. during your cycle and the map oh, out yeah. your heart rate variability and your body temperature. So like using my aura ring really makes sense when you're like, oh my God, my temperature went up or my, you know, people are using their glucose meters and they don't understand the why and that it, it is normal and when to, you know, worry about something, but how that map that out with your hormone cycle and then matching that with fasting and maybe why, you know, your fasting and your eating window and what you eat during those times will be a changing because of the need for more carbs, as you said, to help progesterone and we're more glucose. Sometimes we're more glucose tall or carb tolerant or glucose sensitive, insensitive. Talk a little bit about that. Cause I think fasting, but then what to eat gets confusing for people that they're afraid of, you know, not being keto and, and not burning fat and their blood sugar like, oh, what to do, but how do you well, so, kind of calm so here's people? A question, here's a question I have for you is, did you, do you notice on your CGM that your blood sugar goes up the week before your cycle? I haven't, I haven't had one on lately, but I, that's what, you know, the information says, and I was using um, BioSense. I've been testing with that in the Keto Mojo, they'll be higher and yeah. seeing if that's true. Cause they say that it will be higher the week up, but I do definitely notice my HRV, my body temperature and my heart rate is totally different different type yeah. of cycle, but the glucose and being able to tolerate carbohydrates more so different times of your cycle, I think is interesting to look at if you're more carbon yeah. sensitive. Yeah. And so what I've seen in the women that I've been working with is that they, their CGMs go up naturally that week before and their heart rate variability goes down. Their yeah. sleep's not as good. Yeah. That's, that's progesterone. That's pretty typical. You know, it's something that I think is really interesting about our menstrual cycle that is also not talked about much is this, is that it's a shedding. It's like a detox. Mm -hmm. So your, your body's winding up, it's taking all the bad and it's winding up and then it's going to shed all of that out. It's a beautiful way that our bodies get rid of stuff. So that's a big feat for the human body. So it needs more glucose. It's going to have, uh, you know, you might not sleep as well because it's going through this natural process. Wonder what would happen if it's during a full moon too. <laughs> well, so this is interesting. So I've been asked a lot about, well, what do postmenopausal women do? Yeah. Well, I started to venture into the moon stuff and it's really fascinating. They, there's a lot of belief that, if we didn't have so much blue light coming in, that most women would ovulate at the full moon. So <laughs> it's the problem is we're out of sync with natural light yeah. because we're on computers all the time. We have lights in our house. We have lights from on our phones. And so we're getting this synthetic light that's messing up our, our body's ability to sync with the moon. So, but the, um, but most women will ovulate at the moon. 
So what, what I've been telling postmenopausal women is I would do a start your, like when you learn the fasting cycle, start at the, at the point of uh, ovulation, like the beginning of the manifestation phase would be your first day. And then you go all the way through and it'll make mm -hmm. more sense when people get the, get the book. But, <laughs> but here's the funny thing is that sheesh, if you think about it, like we are so as women, we are so in tune with with um nature and we are we give ourselves no credit for that mm -hmm. and if you look at how a moon cycles it starts to build 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 well that's estrogen and then it peaks well that's that's ovulation where you've got estrogen progesterone and testosterone and then it starts to wax down and it starts to or starts to wane and so now you've got you've got a dip and then you've got the the moon starts to come down into the sliver and now you're you're in no estrogen, no testosterone, but you just have progesterone. So we're very cyclical with the moon. Wow. I didn't know you're into that. I just was thinking of that myself lately, looking at the full moon cycle for parasite cleanses and oh, yeah. cell core. And I've been getting into the cell core full moon cycle. And like, you know, when are, everything kind of syncs together, when you can't find a client's cycle, when they don't know when they start, you go by the full moon. So yeah. Anyways, people are probably asking, how does this have to do with fasting? <laughs> so, well, it helps you understand if you know where you are in your cycle, you don't have a period to find it. Yeah. Then you use the moon. You can use the moon to, to determine it. And then, so if you're figuring out, like if you're perimenopausal in an irregular cycle, you go by the full moon to figure out when you might be like day one. And that's when you can do your longer fasts. Yep. And then we have ovulation. Is that full moon is ovulation you're saying? Yeah, full moon is ovulation. Yeah. That's crazy. And that's right? a good time that to go weird? on the beach walk because the beach right? is really low high tide. And so it's oh. just fascinating how you could tie low it all tide, together. Low tide at the full moon. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if that'd be so Yeah. Well, you do get progesterone during your ovulation window. Beach walks are never bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's my new favorite thing here. So mm -hmm. then your luteal phase, that's just when we want to just take care and just do 12 to 15 hour fasts and not do hard exercise, not do anything intense. And that's when it'd be good to just do self-care time, get your massage, get your nails done <laughs> go for yeah, walks. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that week before our period, we really are meant to be more hibernate, hibernate more, relax more. You definitely don't want cortisol high. You know, um, there, Spain last year came out with a three day menstrual leave, um, uh, like option for women that they could take three days off from their period <gasps> and they no questions asked. What? And I'm like, this is, this is brilliant. But here's the thing is that it shouldn't be during while you're menstruating. It should be before, before. you menstruate. Yeah. So if there's no questions asked, then take those three days <laughs> on like the three days before you bleed, because that's when you really need to bring the cortisol down. Yeah. Hopefully they're not doing testing <laughs> to make sure. That hopefully kind of not. <laughs> I don't know. This came out this early in 22. So I'm not sure like, oh, you know, what funny. exactly came of it, but it was brilliant that a country would start with that. Yeah. Okay. So perimenopause, if you're not sure you cycle, we look at the full moon and then people that haven't had a period for one full year, they're technically in menopause. You know, what changes when we're in menopause, when it comes to fasting and eating, timing your food well, and all that? Well, the first thing for menopausal women is when estrogen goes away, you become more insulin resistant. So fasting is going to work best really well for a, a post menopausal woman. In fact, I'm not really even sure how you would go into those postmenopausal years without fasting, um, because you're getting less and less estrogen as the years go on. So, um, so that's the first thing that I say is that you really, really want to learn how to go in, especially into some of the longer fasts. So then the second thing is you don't have anything to, you don't have a cycle to time it to. So there's a couple of variations you can do. Again, I give a 30 day reset in the book. Um, but you could also do a weekly version, like kind of like what men do, which is five days a week. You do intermittent fasting, whatever your comfortable fasting length is one day a week, you push your fast. And then one day a week, you don't fast. I actually think for postmenopausal women, they may even do two days a week where they don't fast because we still have to mind progesterone. So postmenopausal women are still having to go in and out with their fast. They just don't have a cycle to time it to. So you could do the moon cycle. That's the other way to do it. 
So just to clarify again, so when you say not fast, that means 16 or less or 15 or less? Uh, when I say not fast, I mean 12 or less. 12 or less. Okay. Yeah. I can't imagine that. That must be, if you're fat adapted, however you want to say it, eating like that much, I can't imagine being hungry that much if you don't. You well, that's the biggest that's the biggest problem is that yeah, once you start hungry. fasting, your hunger goes away. Right. Yeah. That's why I find it's like, okay, I got to have some bone broth or, you know, my new yogurt and, you know, right. trying to experiment with what, if I do eat a little bit more, cause I wasn't eating enough. And so there's that, you know, Goldilocks effect, how much is too much fasting for you? If you're not eating enough calories and you have that low energy availability, LEA for a female athlete, that's like, all right, I'm doing this fasting. Is it helping me or when should I reduce the fasting and add more, you know, eating window, make it bigger or eat more when I eat? Cause I got stuck for years doing OMAD. Cause I'm like, I'm not hungry, right? I was burning ton of calories working out, but I do like a giant meal, which I don't think is that great either. Cause you can't even digest it all probably if you eat right, too much. No. And then and you then, have it at night. Most yeah. people have it at night. Yeah. And then you're full and you don't want to eat again. Yeah. So what do you think for people that are, you know, feel like they're not hungry. They're just fasting all the time, but maybe they're low energy availability and they're, they're active females. Yeah. So again, which age group are we talking about? Well, I could, that could be any age group that has it happen, but I guess when is it more at risk for causing other stresses in your body when you're not eating enough and you're fasting too much? Well, the big, the biggest risk around fasting too much is that week before your period. That's, that's where you're going to do the most damage Okay. to, you know, really, really simplify it is like everything needs to be calmed down and be a lot. That's why I call it the nurture phase in the yeah. book. You have to nurture yourself. And uh, I originally was going to call it the chill out phase. It's like, you have to chill yourself out, but I'm like, yeah, yeah it might not be as, <laughs> as loving, So, but it's really about nurturing yourself. So that's the week that everything goes wrong. And here's the thing is that remember progesterone keeps estrogen in balance. Mm -hmm. So if progesterone doesn't do her job, then estrogen, when she starts to come in in the first half of the cycle has a problem. Mm -hmm. So you end up with these wonky cycles, like one of the things that has blown me away, you probably see it in your world too, is how many women don't have a, young women don't have a cycle yeah. or have irregular cycles. Well, when I look at what, like my daughter's 22, when I look at like what women, the stressors that women are going through, the stressors of social media, there's so much like damage that's happening from the comparison on social media. Um, all, you know, this, the world we're living in has a faster pace to it. So this younger generation is already struggling to hormonally because of that. Hmm. So if they also do, you know, fast too much, work out too much that week before, then they're going to struggle even more. Yeah. So do you find it difficult with your resetter group, people not being able to fast because they're so into it and they're just so not hungry and they lost their cravings because they've been doing this a while not to fast and you have to almost like stop. You know, day oh, it's, 20, it's, 28, not yeah. doing it that much. It's like opposite. frightening. It's frightening. And you almost yeah. have to go through a couple of months doing what I call the fasting cycle, picking your different length fasts. And you'll start to see like we've had, I can't wait for numerous reasons. I can't wait for the book to come out. But one of the reasons is that we, when we, when I went to, to write the book, I had five patients that I had put through the fasting cycle where I showed them when to fast, when to do keto, when to eat hormone feasting foods, when to go and step out of fasting. And these five women all were trying to get pregnant and they were told that their BMI was too high, that they wouldn't be able to get pregnant because their BMI was too high. And so I said, well, give it 90 days. Let's see what happens. Within 30 days, each woman, each one of the women got pregnant. And it was just because she was living in accordance with her hormones. So I'd say the same thing about PCOS. I say the same thing about menopause. Like we have to learn how, the personality of these hormones and what lifestyle they want to, yeah. in order for them to flourish. Yeah. I mean, that's, I never could get pregnant when I was 35, you know, we started trying and it's like, okay, I was doing Ironmans and marathons every year, but I was st probably highly stressed. And isn't that interesting? That, you know, I was thinking, oh, was I perimenopausal? Cause I was 42 yeah. when I got my adrenal exhaustion stuff happened, metabolic chaos. And 
couldn't get uh, pregnant before that, but I just thought was like now everything you're teaching and the fasting and all the information we're getting nowadays, like, Oh, was that perimenopausal? My hormones all messed up and right. not really eating enough when I'm supposed to eat. Now it's like, Oh my gosh, we can personalize all this information and really yes. optimize an individual's health for today and their future self. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's funny. Admit your story reminds me of a friend of mine who was trying to get pregnant with her third child. And she came to me because she was like, I can't get pregnant. I did fine with the other two. And so we worked on a couple of things. I taught her the fasting cycle. At the same time, she went to um, a doctor who was like a highly regarded fertility expert. And he listened to her for like 30, for like three hours. And then at the end of three hours, he looked at her and he's like, you need to just chill the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. you need to chill out. But basically what he was saying is you have too much cortisol to get, to get pregnant. And I would say the same thing. If you're working out too much, if you're too much in keto, too much orthorexia, too much mm -hmm. rigidity, we're not meant to be in rigidity the week before our cycle. And that brings me to, I want to mention earlier that we've talked before about, but why the adrenals is so important for, you know, getting to the menopausal female how it's so important to support your adrenals and nurture yourself because who takes over those hormones when the ovaries start to retire. Right. And what someone say it was um, Carrie Jones and was saying, I think that reverse puberty. It's like <laughs> reverse puberty. I love it's, that. It's cruel. It's cruel. You don't, and nobody tells you that. Yeah. But, but yeah, you're right. I mean, this is the thing that I learned in my menopausal journey is like literally at 40, your hormones, your ovaries are like, okay. I'm out, but I'm going to, it's going to take me 10 to 15 years oh, to slowly years. unwind. Ridiculous. I thought it was one year. <laughs> no, <done>. I <laughs> thought it was one year too. I was like, oh, one year of hell. No, it's 10 years. And then it's even, you know, when you're that first year you go without a cycle, when you're mo really moving the cognitive decline, if you're not careful is pretty, pretty gnarly. So, um, but yeah, and the adrenals have to pick up. So somebody else has to pick up the sex hormone drive or, or piece. So if <laughs> your, if your adrenals are tanked, if your, you know, HPA access is completely off, then that is going to be a troubling time for you. Yeah. So the menopausal women, they can, they match their cycle with the moon and they just can vary their cycle based on information in your book. Yeah. But let's go into the benefits. Why do we even need to fast at these different phases of our life? Like, why should we even bother? <laughs> why should we bother? <laughs> well, okay. So it, here's, a, there's two different reasons. One is we have to remember that our cells get energy from two systems, one from the foods we eat and one from when we go without food or burn fat. So the fat burning system is called ketones and the, and the, the, when we eat, we're raising blood sugar. So if you never let the blood sugar go low enough and you never switch over into fat burning ketogenic energy system, then you've, you're missing 50% of the fuel that your brain needs and your cells need. Mm. So your brain thrives on ketones. So again, back to the menopausal women, this is crucially important because as cognitive changes happen because of the loss of hormones, we want to see her go into keto a little bit more often so she can fuel that brain up using ketones. So, um, but if you've never gone into that ketogenic state, then you're missing 50% of the, of the fuel. And, you know, Stephen Gundry's new book, um, is the keto code was really about how the mitochondria need glucose and they need uh, ketones. You know, the whole biohacking world got so excited about powering up mitochondria with, with ketones. But remember, you need both of these systems. So yeah. that would be the first reason to fast is you're giving a nutrient to your cells and your brain that you don't get if you're eating all day. Mm -hmm. the, sec the second piece would be all these healing mechanisms that shift, that turn on. So the longer you go out without food, the more your body heals. Now, more, probably one of the reasons I fast now is that it gets rid of what we call senescent cells. And senescent cells are old, aging, dying cells. And the longer you fast, the more it'll get rid of that set, those cells. The other interesting thing about senescent cells is Bruce Lipton's work taught us that on the outside of these cells is um, our negative beliefs and, and our mm -hmm. thought pattern. So if you're trying to change your thoughts, start doing some longer fast. If you're trying to slow down aging, start doing some longer fast because you're going to get rid of these cells that are speeding up the aging process that are keeping you stuck and looped in thought, different thought patterns. 
So it's, it's really quite amazing. Yeah. I think that's so important because that's not talked about enough. And I know no. Ben talks about that a lot, but I think it's so essential to health is that mind, body, spirit type of work on yourself, not just exercise and what you eat, but how you think is just as important. And that's yes. why I think that happiness and gratitude and making time each day to laugh and have fun is so essential to your so longevity. <laughs> yeah. So important. So important. Yeah. yeah. And you know, when you look at one of the uh, principles that I talk about in the book is the hormonal hierarchy, and that's where oxytocin is really the queen. So oxytocin will calm cortisol down and cortisol when it's, when it's in good shape, will calm insulin down. So you come out of insulin resistance and when you're out of insulin resistance, you'll start to balance those sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. But we can't keep, we can't forget at the top is oxytocin. So it's really funny when you think about what we do is when we want to get healthy, we like do everything extreme. We're like, okay, I'm going to eat, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to go after this with an aggression. And really it's that we got to make sure we don't lose sight of oxytocin. So to your point, laughing, connection, community, all of that becomes really key when you're looking to balance all those hormones that are underneath it. And that's important for my audience is that driven, ambitious, high performer athlete yeah. or non-athlete, just the high charging individuals that we tend to do more is better. And they take all this information and they do it to the extreme and they get a little bit too much of something that they're out of balance that I think it's always like, okay, what I call the holistic method, looking at their nutrition exercise, but their sleep hygiene routine, their stress management. And, you know, what are you doing to nurture yourself and take care of yourself, right. your soul? And it's not just exercise and nutrition or, you know, you got to look at the gut health and the microbiome and the hydration, all that. But I think so much of it, we forget about the play and the gratitude and the, the yeah. love and, and you guys are so good at that. Again, I, I want to say that one, one way we can look at our healthcare system right now is it's very patriarchal. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, you know, masculine. And I think when we, what I'm hoping to do is bring the feminine back into healthcare. And when you bring the feminine back in, you can still be a kick-ass female athlete but you have to know when to rest. Yeah. And that's where cycling, in fact, it's the, it's the form, the highest form of, um, you know, of skill that you can learn. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard when you have been a kick-ass athlete for so long, it's really hard to, to rest yourself. Uh, you know, I get it. I've, I've been there. And that's why going back to your, uh, hormonal hierarchy chart that I think is that really spoke a lot to me when you first started sharing that earlier this year. And I, I'm like, Oh my God, that's exactly what happened to me. You know, yeah. the cortisol and the glucose, the insulin, and it's just this whole thing. It's like, wait, that oxytocin It's just amazing how you get this whole domino effect of your hormones when you don't find that right balance. So fasting can help that a little bit and find that yeah. balance for people. But so the fasting variations, the benefits we're talking about the why, if you are 20 to 30 year old, you think you're invincible. Should you be doing fasting in your twenties and thirties when you're yeah, like, definitely. in college? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you're, you're going to be able to fast so easily kind of like men, you know, men can, can really grab on to fasting very, very easily. I think the hardest group to teach fasting to are the women that are in the perimenopausal years. Yeah. So, um, but I, yeah, definitely that the younger, the better. And, and I, again, again, I'm like blown away at how, what poor health the 20 year olds are in. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, we weren't in that poor of a health and I, and I feel like it's a combination of high stress, um, you know, horrible food, um, and, you know, constant influx of information, the, you know, yeah. we're, we're at an evolutionary mismatch, like the modern world doesn't really sync up with the female body. And mm -hmm. so we have to look at everything from how often we eat to what we eat, to the light exposure we're getting to uh, rhythmic, uh, exercise around our cycle. Like all those things now become more important than ever because of the modern world. So the cell autophagy will help that. Like you're saying 18 hours is the minimal time to get starts yeah, to kick in or 16. 17 so. is about what we see. And the science says 17, but I think, you know, I usually say each, each, um, each, 
healing mechanism is like a switch. So like at somewhere between 12 to 16 hours, you're going to get ketones, you're going to get growth hormone, you're going to get, a, uh, uh, you're going to get CRP uh, going down, you're going to get homocysteine, the inflammatory markers going down. So you already get a healing effect then. Then about 17 hours, it starts to be like a dimmer switch. Autophagy kicks in, but it's not in full force. I've done a lot of research on this, and um, it appears that the max we hit of autophagy is at 72 hours. So you're really going to get the most autophagy benefit when you hit that 72-hour mark, which is why a three-day water fast is, is always a great idea. Okay, so looking at an athlete who wants to exercise all the time, when they're doing a, a water fast, what type of exercise can you do? Oh, anything over 24 hours, you shouldn't exercise. Yeah. See, listen, yeah. everyone, take that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's where listen, I'm afraid people are not hearing that. They do all these fasts that you hear about, and then they're still doing their regular schedule. Yeah. So here's the way to think of it. Once you go over 24 hours, what you're, the signal you're sending your body is you're saying, okay, food is not coming in. I'm going to ask you to repair yourself. And so the body goes into this hyperactive repair phase. And if you start to exercise hardcore, it's a mixed message to the body. So it's really, and you're raising cortisol. You, I mean, over time, you're going to really destroy your health. Mm -hmm. So when I go into a three-day water fast, it's, uh, I, there's no, I mean, sometimes I'll go for a walk, but that's it. Sometimes I'll do yoga, but there is no hardcore exercise. Mm -hmm. So when you are switched to breaking your fast. You've done a lot of videos on this. So people can go to your YouTube channel, follow on Instagram because you share all your information. So when you switch from a, a fasting cell autophagy, then you start to eat. How, what is it? Like, I know you said like sauerkraut and avocado or something. What do you say based on your newest research? What's your new thing to break your fast? Cause everyone always asks that question, right? It's a, it's like the most, I have a whole what chapter. What does Mindy eat? <laughs> yeah. Right. I have a whole chapter on what to break your fast oh, with. Good. And so that was, and we have break your fast recipes in the book, which is really cool. So, uh, three things to break your fast with protein is one. This is definitely for your audience. You know, what I liked, it depends on how tough your workout is. But I think that if you work out in a fasted state, some of the lower fasts, like 14 hours, 15 hours, um, you work out and then you come back and you eat protein, especially you got to get 30 grams of protein. So you can trigger that amino acid receptor site um, and you'll start to stimulate mTOR. So the muscle will grow stronger. So if you're doing like a heavy weightlifting workout, it's a really good idea. Do it in a fasted state. And then after you lift, um, come right home and power up on protein. So for people trying to build muscle, protein's a good one. Uh, people are trying to learn to go train their body to go in a longer fast. I have them break their fast with fat. And it technically doesn't pull them out of a, a fasted state, but it'll kill hunger. So it's the hardest thing to figure out. Like avocados are good. Um, keto cups. I was going to say, you, like, you got kind of a lot of uh, comments on that post you made with, I have keto cups and I'm still fasting. Yeah. It's keto cups is like one of my favorite things. It does not spike my blood sugar. And you can make um, that on your own very easily, you know? Oh, really? I would <laughs> like to figure it out. Yeah. Pinterest. But ah, yeah, it's a, that's a can, great idea. You can easily make it, but it's just, you know, eating some healthy fats, but it's, it's like what we tell athletes too, when you're switching to have some fuel before your workout, you're still going to be burning fat. And that's kind of depends on your goal of fasting. Are you trying to do like just a water only fast? But if you have some fat, are you still going to get cell autophagy or right. is just to be in ketosis? Right. Exactly. And, and, and then the third thing that we, I recommend is the three P's. So this yeah. is if you're trying to repair your gut. So polyphenol, probiotic, and prebiotic foods. So you can combine them all. Like one of my favorite things to break a fast with is an avocado with sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. And then I sprinkle some hemp seeds on it. And uh, it's prebiotic with the hemp seeds, pro, uh, probiotic with the sauerkraut and a good fat with the avocado. I so feel like a pretty... stalker. I know all these answers. <laughs> Excellent. So, I, so yeah, that's one of my favorite, but you yeah. can do all three if you want. It's just, you know, what I saw in the fasting world is that we lost what the intention is behind the length of fast. Mm -hmm. And we lost what the intention is behind breaking the fast. People exactly. just started fasting. Yeah. They were doing one meal a day and then they went back into food. 
and did whatever, whatever they wanted with food. And so what I'm trying to do is give women a different approach. And I think that's so huge is that it's same thing with keto. People start eating whatever they want fat with all the vegetable oils and the crappy fat, fatty yeah. foods that they forgot what's the purpose. And then now it's like, okay, bring it back to nature's foods. Fasting doesn't mean eat whatever you want when you're eating. So fast and feast doesn't mean like go right. on a binge fast <laughs> right. when that window opens up that it's, it's still taking care of the whole you when you're yeah. eating, what you're eating is important and how you're eating it. Yes. It's essential. Exactly. But yeah. I know I'm going to run out of time and I do want to ask you the last little bit on the fasted exercise. So, you know, we've been greenfield and I've asked you this tons of times, but the 12 to 15 hours for females to exercise fasting and, you know, when to eat before workout, have you gotten into any more research yeah. on that or thoughts? I, I there's no research, right? Cause yeah. we don't have a lot of research. <laughs> the N equals one research. <laughs> yeah. The N equal one equals one research for sure. Um, you know, I think you have to experiment. Um, this year, one of my focus has been to try to build muscle as a 53 year old woman. And so I played with both of them mm -hmm. and I find that I build muscle better. If I go, if I do like a 13, 14 hour fast, and then I do my, my workout and then I come home and eat protein, mm -hmm. just like I mentioned, and you got to make sure you get 30 grams of protein to trigger that amino acid sensor. So that, that would be one thing that I've noticed. Now, sometimes if you're like, I can't work out in a fasted state, then try eating protein because you're getting those amino acids before you work out. Um, I just, uh, I've trained myself to work out in a fasted state. I, I, I struggle. Yeah. I don't really notice a power difference. It's not like I notice a difference in, in how much I can work out, you know, the, mm -hmm. my ability to work out when I eat in, in the, if I eat before, I don't know. What have you noticed? Well, I've been experimenting because it's always like, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, if this is my normal, but could I feel better? Yeah. And I want to get stronger as well. And so I'm just trying to biohack my way through this menopause thing and yeah. think that I'm not going to notice anything, but I'm trying to build muscle more. And I think sometimes experimenting, you know, not being so strict on pre-workout coffee, like I can't have anything in it, but have I just started trying the Bub's collagen and Bub's MCT oil in it, mm. in it because I'll go lift weights in the morning, then I'll go for a run. And so it's like, is it, am I getting less of a workout performance wise if I don't have anything before? And I just have a few sips of the coffee, but is that helping me? Or if it puts some creatine in it and, you know, I have essential amino acids. I was experimenting with that. It's like, you know, do I notice a difference or if it's more post-workout, but then I start working, then I forget to eat. And then suddenly it's right. like hours go by. So yeah, it's always it's that N equals one experiment, like yeah. how to get that food in. That's why I like putting calories in my coffee and experimenting, adding the, the peptide collagen peptides or having some, you know, the creatine I put in there to see if that's okay, if that actually does anything. And so just, you know, experimenting to see, okay, is my, do I feel stronger today? And do I feel right. faster? Am right. I recovering more? So yeah, I don't know so much, yeah. so, so much, but this is, but you bring up a really good point that I, I don't want women to lose is you can hear a principle like the ones we're talking about now go test it on yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think more than, than men, we are, have a lot of bio individuality and we have to learn what works best for us. Yeah. And that's what I keep trying to say. It's like, you know, all the information out there is based on men. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out what works for you and what day of your cycle it is on. And if you yep. should eat or not eat, cause that's the whole question. Should I do fasted exercise or not? And yep. how long should I fast? And it gets so confusing out there. So I know your book will be welcomed by everyone out there. All the females should be pre-order. Actually, you have a lot, a lot <laughs> of bonuses, your pre-order. Yeah, we've and had a lot. I don't know when this episode is coming out, but we've done some amazing bonuses. Yeah. Like, I'll post a video, but the audio won't come out to January, but the people watching okay. the video, you should do this now because even the, the who's Daniel Patrick and you got some celebs going on your yeah. show. Yeah. Too. We, well, I've been working with, uh, uh, Danica, Danica Patrick Danica. and, um, Leanne rhymes, uh, for the last year, um, very closely teaching them exactly what I just talked about and helping them detox things like that. Um, and they're, they're just amazing women that are just like you and me that mm -hmm. just never learned their hormones. And so now, yeah. you know, now they're learning it. And so I'm bringing them and then Elle McPherson, 
um, onto a master class. I don't know when the, you know, this, this, the video will come out, but we're doing that on December 20th for people who pre-ordered the book. And what yeah. I, it's really cool. I've asked all three of them if I could go into really like, you know, what is it, what it, being a woman means to them. It's going to be a really heartfelt discussion. So I'm really excited for it. Bring your box of Kleenex. <laughs> Bring your box of Kleenex. Cause well, especially when Leanne talks, whoo. This woman, like you think her music is, it touches your soul. Like she, that woman has got so much heart. It's incredible. Wow. Good for you. Well, you're just amazing. I just don't know how you keep it up because you're just on the go all the time and videos and podcasts and researching <laughs> and writing books and just so much. So you have a amazing passion and drive yourself. So thank you for keeping it up and exploring new areas that no one else has tapping into. Yeah, no, no, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. So thank you for having me, I, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Good. Anytime you want to come back on and I'm sure everyone has questions. So we welcome the book coming out and people can, where should people buy it? Fastlikeagirl.com. Okay. Um, they can go to, and then one thing I've been really emphasizing is Bookstore. really, I really, <laughs> yeah. Book, bookshop.org. I really want to oh. support the little local bookstores. So the indie bookstores hmm. that, I mean, we don't want them to go away. So if you go to bookshop.org, it will tell you your local one and you can have it shipped directly to you from bookshop.org. Yeah. I know those poor bookstores. I always just buy stuff from Amazon. Like, ah, I should not do that. Don't support Amazon as much as the little people are all going out of business. We don't buy from them. So thank you. Good point. All right. Good luck with the launch and we'll be watching on social media. Thank you. Appreciate it, Debbie.